So welcome to the ankle case of the MSK Olympics where I will show you the solution. I will show you the winning time which is so ridiculously fast you will not believe it. And when I saw the time for the first time I was thinking wait a minute something's not right here. But I had a chat with the guy it makes total sense. So watch till the end to learn how quickly he was able to report this ankle MRI. First we will go over the case. I will show you how I went through the case, what I see what I described, then we will have a look at the winning criteria or the qualifying criteria that I use to assess the submissions and ultimately we will have a look at the times of the participants which are very very surprising. So let's start with the case and by the way the case is also in the description down below you can find the link to the case there and with that you can basically test yourself, you can pause the video here, you can take your uh, phone or stopwatch, you go over the case Try to report the case, take your time and then you can at the end compare your reporting time first of all with the submissions from the MSK Olympics but you can also see whether you would have qualified with your report given the criteria that I will show you later here today. But here is the case, we can see it's an ankle MRI and there was an ankle twisting injury or distortion 11 days before the MRI and the radiograph was normal but the patient has persistent medial pain. So. The question is what's the reason for the pain, is there a fracture, bony avulsions or any other stuff. So this is the actual clinical information. Okay, so when we look at the case I will always start with the joint itself. We can see there's a little bit of an effusion here, this is a couple of days after the trauma which can be the case. There is a structure here in the anterior recess which is not fat. This is most likely a little blood cloth or something. But it's not a osteochondral body because we don't see any osteochondral lesion at the Taylor uh, shoulders here. So I think that's okay. Uh, we can see there is a mild bone marrow edema at the medial malleolus and the fibula here is intact. There is no fracture there. We've got one marker, one marker on the lateral side. We got another marker on the medial side. But going back to the joint, so joint diffusion. Some subtle areas of bone marrow edema at different locations, colliculus posterius here, fibula fine. The posterior part here or the subtalar joint also shows a little bit of an effusion here. Uh, there's not really much more wrong here. Again also here we've got some little linear structure but that's not cartilage or anything. This is also not fat. Maybe again it's a bit of a, either like some form of a capsule fold or a little bit of a blood uh, cloth here but it looks more like a oh this is more posterior so let's go anterior this can just be maybe like some form of a synovial fold I don't think it's relevant for the case so going back to the other joints uh, we go to the smaller joints here mainly we want to look at the Chopard joint and you can see the joint capsule is nice we can go to the calcaneo cuboid joint here we also don't see much wrong we don't really have a nice outlining of the bifurcate ligament but I think uh, given the fact we have got a normal joint capsule here and we can also check here we can also see normal tendon and joint capsule here no effusion here you know there's not a major injury here at the calcaneo cuboid joint from what we can see here in such a short time after the trauma and the smaller joints here the Lis Frank joint mainly are intact okay so that's for the joints now the next thing we want to do is the assessment of the syndesmosis and for this we can start here When you can see the marker is quite on this level but when we look closely here we can see the striations we can see Bosset's ligament here they are all continuous straight down and when we go to the coronal we can also see the nice striations that we see here so the anterior syndesmosis is actually intact and when we go to the posterior syndesmosis I wouldn't expect much here if the anterior one is okay anyways this is also not consistent with any major injury here so I think posterior syndesmosis is also intact and also there is no you know, edema in the interosseous region, interosseous ligaments or in the interosseous membrane there is no evidence of a higher grade or high ankle sprain. Now that's for the syndesmosis. Now the next thing I want to look at is the lateral collateral ligaments and here we can use any of these series. When we go from the syndesmosis further down we should be able to see a nice ATFL anterior tail of fibular ligament here but you can see this is completely thickened it's completely torn off here or ripped out of the uh, tailor attachment so complete ATFL tear and this was one of the major criteria that you needed that you needed in the report 
in order to qualify. So if you said partial tear or intact or sprain, that was not enough. And from here we can see there's a large fluid collection or hematoma going all the way up over the anterior syndesmosis here. So large hematoma here also together with the ligament injury explaining the swelling and also the pain on the lateral side at least. Now ATFL done, we go to the LFC. And the LFC, we normally see a nice black structure like this underneath the peroneal tendons. And here we don't really see much. We see a thickened, high signal, uh, calcaneal attachment of the LFC. And proximally, we don't really see any proper continuous ligament. So it's a completely torn CFL here. There's not even a partial tear. There's nothing really going through. So we can call that. And now if you want to really be picky, you can argue, okay, there's a small band here, but this is not CFL. This is part of the arcuate fibers. What's going on with my silly monitor? Let's wait. Gone. I don't know what this is. Okay, so yeah, so you can see this little structure here. This is part of the arcuate ligaments or arcuate fibers connecting here the calcaneus directly to the talus. Uh, as an anatomic variant but you know if you want to give a partial tear here is fine but nobody ever describes these anyway so we can just forget about it and ptfl in most cases will be intact and also here i rated this as intact i mean there is some edema here but it's not like a, a major injury we can see the restoration is still preserved and uh, you know if you want to give a little sprain i'm okay but mostly it's continuous okay so you can also see here the nice black bands here that's fine now that was the lateral ligament now let's go to the medial collateral ligaments and here what we first of all we can see there's a bone bruise here at the medial tailor neck or a dome uh, this is from a supination injury we have the lateral collateral ligaments torn to two ligaments here torn so this was some form of a supination injury and we also see the bone bruise here in the posterior colliculus meaning this part crushed against this here creating here an indentation here with an impression fracture and also the ligaments in between mainly the deep deltoid fibers are completely crushed and torn so anything from tear to partial tear or high grade partial tear was accepted i think as a criteria and then when we go for the superficial deltoid ligament we can see this is also not the normal appearance of the talocalcaneal component it's too bright in terms of its signal so that's either high grade sprain or partial tear and then we see tibial spring so we can see supramedial spring ligament component but the tibial spring here also has uh, thickening fraying it's, it's too high in terms of its signal there's also an injury here to this ligament uh, whether this is now very acute or not is hard to say sometimes or acute and chronic but and I accepted anything from sprain to, to partial tear uh, was accepted as a qualifying uh, dictation. But there is more to this. And the finding that I wanted to see ideally was the stripping, the periosteal stripping here of the flexor retinaculum here. You can see this is the flexor retinaculum that's periosteally stripped off. Basically, it's a fascial sleeve avulsion of the um, medial malleolus here. And this can lead to chronic pain or pain long after a dislocation or twisting injury sorry so you can see this is lifted off here creating this pocket where potentially the posterior tibial tendon can dynamically sublux into this area because it's stripped off sometimes better seen on non fat set studies so we can see here this is the flexor retinaculum and this should insert nicely here onto the bone like this and in this case it goes all the way here and stripped off here and this can sometimes also be stripped off together with the anterior insertion here of the deltoid ligament you can see this is a part of tibial spring coming up here but in this case it's mainly flexor retinaculum with periosteal stripping and i think only one or two people actually described this specific finding but i wanted to have some information about the superior of the superficial deltoid ligament as a qualifying criteria uh, by any means and not just go with a normal superficial ligament so i was quite generous in terms of what was accepted here as a qualifying criteria then for the spring ligament itself so we go down we can see here beneath the tailor head and the posterior tibial tendon we have the supramedial component of spring ligament and this is distally quite frequently a little bit higher now if you give a sprain here that was okay it was with neither a major nor a minor criteria as the spring ligament here 
or the supramedial component of the spring ligament complex and certainly the plantar components here are intact so nothing is really majorly torn here and yeah so that's for the ligament complex let's move on to the tendons and the tendons so we can see plantar epineurosis is fine achilles tendon shows a little bit of thickening so there's some mild tendinosis happening here and then we can go to the extensor tendons and in the extensor tendons we can see the distal anterior tibial tendon insertion is fine we can see the other extensor tendons as far as we can tell are okay then we see a little bit of fluid or hemorrhage into the tendon sheath of the posterior tibial tendon whereas the ex uh, flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus here is unremarkable a little bit of fluid can be expected nothing to worry about as for the peroneal tendons we can we come down here i don't see a definitive split injury yet you now here some of it might also be retinaculum you know lines like this i don't think this is necessarily the tendon as we can see here but we can double check here so i think this is part of the superior peroneal retinaculum some people described an injury there uh, which is, I think, is very sensitive, but yeah, obviously you, you can give these minor injuries if you want. I don't think there's enough edema here for me to consider this as a as a major thing. Um, yeah, I didn't really have the perineal tendon or anything here at the perineal tendon as a major or minor criteria, so I did not use that to qualify the reports. So, and also if you look proximally, the perineal retinaculum here is fine. Now, going, going to the soft tissues, we talked about already about the flexor retinaculum stripping as a fascial sleeve avulsion here. Now, let's have a look at the sinus tarsi, which is fine. We see the fat preserved, not, not much wrong there. And there were quite a few reports describing sprains of cervical ligament and other sinus tarsi ligaments. I think, you know, given the fact we had kind of like a substantial injury, if there's a little bit of edema, I'm kind of like not going to the nitty-gritty ligament stuff here because I think this is hardly reproducible to come up with any um, injuries of any of these ligaments here in the sinus tarsi in such a multi-ligament injury case. Just so for sake of speed and just to make it not unnecessarily complicated. Then the musculature I think is fine. We don't see any fatty atrophy or any funny changes there. And uh, lastly, we want to have a look at the tarsal tunnel or the posterior tarsal tunnel for you know anatomic variants, additional muscles, our accessory muscles, masses, or anything wrong with the nerves. But this is all looking fine. So ultimately, the conclusion was a complete tear of ATFL, LFC. Uh, these were the two major ligament tears. Then I wanted to have a tear of the deep ligament here, something wrong with the fascial sleeve avulsion, periosteal stripping, or I accepted also anything wrong with the superficial deltoid ligament, either spring or back here. Anything should be, you know, people should realize there's something wrong there. I also wanted to have the bone bruise or the impaction fracture here. I think there is a true indentation. Um, that was also another one of these criteria. I will show you this later. And then uh, I think the rest was just some minor findings that I will show you next. Okay, so let's have a look at the criteria that I used to assess the report together with the Gemini algorithm. And I had to change this after the first pass. This qualified most reports because they didn't mention the periosteal stripping of the flexor retinaculum, which I had as a major criteria. So I realized, okay, that's maybe a bit too much detail. So I tuned it down a little bit. And you can see the report needed to have the complete tear of ATFL. That was one of the criteria. The CFL, I was a bit more generous, so at least the partial tear should have been described, if it's a tear, even better. Then I wanted to have at least some form of a tear, very broad description here of the deep deltoid fibers, and any injury of the superficial deltoid fibers, including the periosteal sleeve avulsion or periosteal stripping or anything like that, was put into this category, and ultimately the bone bruise or contusion or even the impaction fracture of the tailor neck should have been mentioned in one way or the other. So five criteria that needed to be in the report in order to qualify. So let's have a look at the reports. So here you can see the reports here, first report, second report and so on, and you can see some of them qualified here, some didn't, some only qualified after my final assessment where the Gemini algorithm was a bit uh, struggling with that. So, but let's have a look at the times. Starting time was 1958 and 30 seconds. This is when the submission form or the case link was posted. 
and you can see the winning time or the winning report was submitted just one and a half minutes later and to be more exact after one minute and 29 seconds so this is a super speedy report super amazing but look at the amount of text that was submitted together with this report now it probably takes me longer than one and a half minutes just to read this text so it's really interesting how this person achieved such an amazing result with one minute and 29 seconds actually describing all these injuries and it was not an easy case by any means so there were a lot of different findings going on and he basically described all the listed criteria and qualified with this amazing time for the first place in this ankle competition. Here we have the distribution of qualified and disqualified reports into the corresponding minute brackets. So we can see one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, up to 19 minutes. And the blue ones are disqualified reports for missing mostly the superficial deltoid ligament injury and then qualified reports which had described all these different criteria as I set out in the second list here. So as you can see, there is no real relationship in between speed and accuracy. It's not like the later reports were better, not at all. I think here again is a nice example of how, especially with the first report, how a systematic approach, a clear strategy and a great technical solution can help us achieve these kind of like reports. So really nice to see and this kind of like a little bit of a normal distribution in terms of the speed of the times, but the even the accuracy is kind of like following, following the same pattern, if you will. So how is it possible to report such a busy case in just one minute and 29 seconds uh, with all the major findings described? I think this is incredible. And the guy who did this, I had a chat with him and he told me his secret in a way and I think you will be very interested to hear how he achieved it but this is something for the post-match interviews where I will ask him directly again and you will then see and learn how he did it and how you can maybe achieve similar results in the future. We know now the times of all the three disciplines and now you want to see actually who is it like who was actually able to report so fast and that's the next video that you can watch. Okay, that's it. So I hope you liked this format. You liked the MSK Olympics. I'm sure I will do a second edition despite all the naysayers. I don't care. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Give the videos a like. This helps me out in the long run. And now in the next video, you can watch the winners and what they have to say about the competition.